right, everyone, we're going to get started. Everyone could take their seats, please. Well, I'm going to be mercifully brief. You've heard a lot from me over the course of the last few days. I'm Clark Irvin, the director of the Aspen Institute's Homeland Security Program and the organizer of the Aspen Security Forum. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the closing session of the forum. Uh, I hope that over the course of the last few days you've been stimulated and challenged, that you've learned something and that you'll come back for next year. Um, I want to thank our media partner, the New York Times, our four sponsors, Mission Essential Personnel, I2, IBM, and AGT International. I want to thank all of our supporters, with a special thanks to Jane Harmon, who's seated here in the front row. And with that, let me turn it over to Walter Isaacson, the President and CEO of the Institute. And I mainly want to thank Clark, who pulled together a really great forum. And at Secretary Napolitano's behest, we're putting together a good working group, because one of the things I think the Aspen Institute can do, along with Jane Harmon and the Wilson Center, is elevate uh, some of the discourse from the deep and bad uh, ideological divides and partisanship we feel these days. When you look at what's happening these days and you want to know what could be good and what could be right about America, you'd look at Secretary Chertoff and Secretary Napolitano. And when you look at some of the problems the media is having today and you want to know what could be right, you'd look at Pete Williams. So it's my honor to introduce both of them. Thank you, Walter, for that understatement. Um, <laughs> You are, uh, you are looking at two-thirds of everyone who's ever led the Department of Homeland Security, and although Janet Napolitano and Michael Chertoff were appointed by presidents of different parties, they do have a few things in common. They were born just 15 miles apart, New York City for her, Elizabeth, New Jersey for him. Both served as U.S. attorneys, Mr. Chertoff in New Jersey, Secretary Napolitano in Arizona. He was appointed the second Homeland Security by President George W. Bush, succeeding Tom Ridge, and to accept the position, he had to take off an article of clothing, a black robe, to step down from his position on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, and he's now the chairman and co-founder of the Chertoff Group in Washington. Secretary Napolitano came to Washington from Arizona, where she was the first woman ever to serve as the state's attorney general, and at the time President Obama nominated her, she was in her second term as governor, having been re-elected in a landslide, beating her opponent by 28 percentage points. Let me uh, start by asking you. <laughs> if this were the political forum, it would have gotten much bigger response. <laughs> Let me ask you this question to start with. In, in small towns all over America, once a year, there's a sign that goes up in front of the city hall, and it's the outline of a thermometer, and red paint climbs up to show how well the community is doing in fundraising for the local community chest. If there were such a sign out in front of the Department of Homeland Security on Nebraska Avenue, I want to ask you both where the line would be on that thermometer. Secretary Napolitano, obviously the threat evolves, it changes, but how close are we to achieving the goal, the objectives for which the department was set up? Well, obviously uh, um, the department is still forming, it's still maturing, it's eight years old. Uh, but uh, based on the work that went on with my predecessors uh, and what we've been able to accomplish over the last two and a half years, it, it really is gelling now uh, into a homeland security, I would say, enterprise uh, that includes I intelligence, analysis, and sharing across the rest of the country. Uh, that in includes uh, really a strategic outlook for how we protect our land borders. Uh, that uh, is moving toward more risk-based screening in places such as our nation's airports. Uh, that has a, a much larger international footprint for information uh, sharing uh, and a much larger uh, state and local law enforcement footprint uh, than it had before. So what we're doing is knitting all of these things together uh, into a context that uh, falls uh, under the Homeland Security umbrella. Now, it's not like a thermometer, right? It's not like when you reach $100,000, you're done. Uh, we're never done. Uh, the work we're involved in is always changing. The threats are always evolving. Uh, the challenges uh, are never-ending. 
Uh, but what we are doing and are uh, a long way toward is really creating a, a departmental sense, a homeland security sense of what that means for, for the country. Mr. Chertoff, uh, granted the threat of alls and things change, but in terms of putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, is it now assembled and working in your opinion? Uh, you know, I, I agree with Janet. I think this is, um, it's become a much more mature enterprise, uh, obviously, than when it started eight years ago. And a lot of it is the, the binding together of the various elements to have a, a, a capability to operate jointly. That means joint planning, joint execution. Uh, <laughs> moving people among different components so you have more of a sense of the totality of the department and people are focusing on the total mission rather than individual tasks. And then another thing which happens over time, which I think is really important, is developing a common culture. You have an agency that was brought together with a number of significant elements drawn from other departments. And over the period of years, <clears throat> they have drawn a, a culture which is risk managed based does look um, outwardly and not just inwardly, um, has had to learn to coordinate with other federal departments and also with state and locals. I think something that uh, you know, Secretary Napolitano experiences and I experienced is probably the Secretary of Homeland Security interacts with more governors on a regular basis than any other cabinet officer uh, in the U.S. cabinet because you're dealing with everything from grants to disasters, uh, to issues involving law enforcement and intelligence. And so that, again, has an imprint on the culture of the department. So then let's look at what you do every day. How has the threat evolved? How is the threat different today for you, uh, Secretary Napolo, than, Napolitano, than it was for you when you were Homeland Security Secretary? Well, I think um, one thing is, you know, and as we run up to the 10th anniversary of, of 9-11, uh, based on uh, what's been established at the department, there are many, many layers of uh, activities that would have served to interrupt such a large-scale uh, international plot, from better intel uh, gathering to uh, screening uh, uh, students at flight schools to simple things like hardening cockpit doors on airplanes. Um, and so... Uh, that all, uh, those large-scale international plots of that ilk um, would be very difficult, if not impossible, to carry out today. Uh, in their place, however, it's, it's always a changing uh, methodology. So it's putting a bomb in a toner cartridge and uh, putting it into the cargo stream, hoping that it gets uh, on a passenger plane. Um, it, it is... Uh, uh, as uh, the most recent threat that uh, became open source uh, revealed, it's uh, implanting explosives within a human body to get on a plane. So uh, the tactics, the techniques um, uh, change. Um, we have seen in addition, uh, and I've seen this really evolve over the last two and a half years, is, is the so-called so homegrown. Uh, the, the, uh, the U.S. person uh, from the United States in the United States maybe uh, acting totally uh, alone, the so-called lone wolf, or, or with just one or two others uh, to carry out a plot, uh, whether motivated by uh, an Islamist uh, type uh, ideology or an anti-government type ideology, uh, but we have seen that kind of homegrown plot uh, in itself uh, uh, mature uh, in a way over the last two and a half years. If that's the case, Mr. Chertoff, then what's the Department of Homeland Security supposed to do about that? Well, so let me, let me put this in context. Um, if I go back to 2007, and <clears throat> I think I publicly said this, um, what we began to see was a, a, an increased focus on the part of al-Qaeda on developing Westerners who didn't have uh, records of being terrorists or criminals, who had legitimate passports, who had citizenship or residency, and who understood the culture of the West, and uh, to try to train and develop them uh, and make them operatives. And that was a tribute to the fact that we had made it much more difficult to bring foreigners into the United States to carry out missions. And that pipeline was developed over a period of time, and, and that, I think, has led to what we have seen in terms of the increased use of what we call these homegrown American citizen or other westernized terrorists in operations. Now, what that means is this. <clears throat> it means that in addition to the traditional tools of intelligence gathering we used to try to see what was going on overseas, 
uh, where we're you know using spies and satellites and 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 things of that sort. We have to look at where the risk is within, and that's a different tool set, uh, both from a legal authority standpoint and from a capability standpoint. That's going to require much more reliance on state and local law enforcement who are going to be, and frankly, on the community, including the Muslim community in the case of Islamic terrorists, uh, because they're going to be the ones who can detect the anomalies. Now, the good news is we have seen citizens step up. Many of the plots that were foiled, Fort Dix, uh, the uh, 2007 plot in Glasgow and London, came because individuals stepped forward. The challenge is going to be, and I know the current secretary feels this, and I know uh, Jane Harmon is a big advocate of this, is to build up the capability at the state and local level to detect these things when they're in their incipiency and to then drive the sharing of the information vertically in the way that we've done horizontally. But if the threat is uh, becoming more of a homegrown threat, that's everybody but Homeland Security in a way, isn't it? It's the FBI, it's local law enforcement. Is your role now basically to say, if you see something, say something, please help? Well, that's one of them. In fact, uh, uh, thank you for saying if you see something, say something. Uh, That is uh, the campaign that we have undertaken this year based on a campaign slogan from the Metropolitan Transit Authority in New York. And it's designed to say, look, one of the evolutions in Homeland Security is the recognition that no one federal department uh, can uh, can completely secure the nation. That it, it is a shared responsibility. Uh, and the see something, say something idea, very easy to remember, is something that we want everyone to uh, to incorporate. And then you marry that, of course, with appropriate ways for how do you sift out the real from the unreal uh, threat? How do you make sure that uh, state and local law enforcement are focused on uh, the right kinds of uh, issues? and that they're very knowledgeable about and trained about the newest tactics and techniques and and behaviors that are tip-offs to what uh, terrorists are contemplating. A lot of the seminars here this week have delved into these issues in great detail, and our mission here is to sort of uh, scan the horizon at at the 10,000-foot level. And one of my challenges is to try to produce answers that don't say, well, as Mike just said. So let me ask you an area where I think you may disagree. Uh, Because the 9-11 hijackers used fraudulent IDs, the 9-11 Commission recommended a secure identification for all Americans. Mr. Chertoff, you pushed hard for what was called real ID, which would require states to more closely check the backgrounds of anybody applying for a driver's license. Secretary Napolitano, you signed a bill when you were governor that banned Arizona from complying with that. So uh, (laughs) do we need more secure IDs? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I think the answer to that is yes, and, but I'm going to somewhat undercut your effort to create dissension here <coughs> by, um, by observing that one of the elements of one of the recommendations, and I know Richard remembers this, was to deal with the crossing of the border, the land border. And we put into place a Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, which we began un, under, um, in my tenure, which was designed to get more robust identification for people coming from Canada into the United States. And it was a, somewhat controversial, um, and some of the northern governors didn't like it, but I'm, I'm delighted to say that uh, Janet executed and finished that job and put it into place and unveiled it. And by the way, it works really well, I'm told. Um, I, you know, my feeling on the driver's licenses and more generally on identification is this. Um, there are times we need to be able to identify people. We need to be able to know who they are when they get on airplanes. We're probably going to need to know more about who they are when they, get, when they log on to get into bank accounts. And therefore, the means of identification has to be secure. And that means the process of, of creating and designing it has to be secure from the time we identify what we will rely upon as proof of identity and the security of the card itself. So um, I I don't think there's a great difference in objective. Um, I know there are issues about who pays for it, which governors always have with the federal government, but um, I still think that the the 9-11 recommendation is right. Getting secure identification is an enabler of privacy and not uh, not an impediment to privacy. Does Secretary Napolitano... Does Secretary Napolitano feel the same way about this as Governor Napolitano did? Well, I'm just, I'm just hearkening back to my, my governor days and, and uh, when the, every governor in the United States signed a letter uh, 
opposing uh, uh, real ID as it was then formulated. And the, the two lead governors, the two of us that got all the signatures were myself and, and Mark Sanford of South Carolina. So, you know, it, it, I mean, it shows that even from broad distances you can reach a consensus. Um, and the consensus uh, in that case, you know, the, the, the real ID uh, bill was not a bill. It was a footnote on an appropriations bill and there had never been an opportunity for real hearings uh, or vetting with the governors who would actually have to uh, implement its requirements where driver's licenses are concerned. And it was very expensive. So is it just too hard to do? No. Uh, and in, indeed, uh, as uh, uh, states are moving toward more secure driver's licenses, uh, licenses with a biometric on them, the issue is identification, authentication, and verification. Uh, and the ability to do that in certain uh, settings, as Mike just said, is, is very, very important. Are we dealing with the person standing here uh, who, who is that person, or are we actually dealing with someone else? And it sounds like a simple question to pose, but it is, from a variety of standpoints, a difficult question to answer. Let me ask you about one of the 9-11 Commission recommendations that has produced virtually no change whatever. Quote, Congress should create a single principal point of oversight and review for Homeland Security. Obviously, that's not been done. Thank you, members of Congress. But uh, beyond the burden that it creates for the department in terms of all those members you have to deal with and all those hearings you have to go to, does it actually make any difference that you have to answer to all those different masters? Well, I'll go first and... and um uh, and it really does. I, you I have mean, to be more polite than I do because you still have to go back and deal with them. I don't. Well, so I, you can leave me I'm, to I'll that be the warm-up, and then you can really uh, – <laughs> but, you know, it uh, – uh, you know, forget the hearings and the, and the reports, and, and, and you know, which are endless, innumerable, and take up a lot of a lot of space in the department. You just set that aside. But the fact that the Congress is not well organized on the homeland security front means that there's no one place in the Congress where you get an overall uh, strategic view about not only what we're doing. Uh, but what we intend to do in the short term and what the long-term planning is. Uh, and uh, this is more so uh, a problem in the House than in the Senate. Uh, in the Senate, you've got the Homeland Security Committee. Uh, they've uh, divvied up the Appropriations Committee the appropriate way. But in the House, not only do you have the Homeland Security Committee, but you've got other committees uh, who are uh, really exacting lots of or enacting lots of jurisdiction on Homeland Security matters. And... Uh, it, w Homeland Security, from a strategic thinking perspective, is not aided by this effort, and, and it really is getting in the way of having uh, a congressional view of what the Homeland Security architecture needs to be. I, I mean, that was my experience as well, and, and the practical effect of it is this, and, and it's not just about, you know, having to testify at a lot of hearings and, and uh, writing a lot of papers, but some of the committees <clears throat> that are not uh, homeland Security Committees, particularly in the House, um, are focused on individual elements of the department that were at one time under the committee's jurisdiction. They have a very strong interest in driving certain policies as it relates to those elements. And frankly, often that's because they have certain relationships with business groups or outside groups, and they're inclined to see things in a, in a particular way. And so they are <clears throat> pulling in a direction that is often discordant with the overall strategic approach of both the Department and the Homeland Security Committee. And there's not a single point of contact. You can't go to one committee and work out in a dialogue between the executive and the legisl legislative branch what the appropriate pr priorities are. So this is not just that it's a nuisance. This really affects the ability to execute a coherent, uh, comprehensive strategy for Homeland Security. Let me ask you both whether you think a, a Secretary of Homeland Security has too much to do. Mr. Chertoff, uh, I think most Americans think that the job of Homeland Security is to prevent us from another, uh, protect us from another terror attack or manage the consequences. You spent a great deal of your time worrying about hurricanes. Secretary Napolitano, you came into uh, office teaching us how to cough on our sleeves with the H1N1 virus, and then you were managing the Gulf oil spill crisis. Uh, if while you both were doing all those things, we'd had another Christmas Day bombing attempt, uh, is, is, are those the sorts of things that a Secretary of Homeland Security should be doing? 
Well, you know, we had, um, I mean, I, I, I was in office a little longer. I've got four years. We had multiple things going on, you know, at various points in time, both nat- natural disasters and plots and things of that sort. Um, and, I, you know, like the military has to equip and train to fight more than one war. I think that you have to do that at Homeland Security. The value is this. If you look at Homeland Security as a system, it runs from prevention <clears throat> to protection, you know, hardening the target to response and recovery. And your ability to deal with threats, however they're generated, is enhanced if you can bind together and operate all those levers. Um, And and even take something like the oil spill. I mean, that is an incident management exercise. And the ability to manage an incident in that kind of dynamic, while it's not directly translatable to a natural disaster like a wildfire or to a terrorist attack, there is a lot of cross-pollination. So I actually thought that, you know, again, as the department matured, the ability to jointly operate in a variety of domains, all hazards, was important. And remember, you know, the threat is not always going to be static. Uh, We could wind up with a much greater challenge across our southern border. Um, So it's not always going to be just al-Qaeda and the traditional issues. And the department's got to be capable of dealing with the hazards across the board. But you seem to be saying that managing a hurricane is good on, good on the job training for if there were a terror attack. That seems to be what you're saying. The advantage. I mean, I, 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 to be honest, there is obviously there are differences. <clears throat> there are some different authorities and different issues. But uh, I, I can tell you from the I don't know how many fires, hurricanes, the airline plot of 2006, we got better as a department. And we got better working with our partners because the experience of going through real activity, really uh, dynamic and challenging incidents, uh, made us better at uh, dealing with incident management across the board. And I think if you were to stovepipe, what you get is uh, you get a little more specialization, but you lose the breadth and the experience, which in my, in my view actually adds value. Were there days when you said, they're asking me to do too much? No, ma'am. <laughs> Look, uh, it's, a, it's a big, sprawling department, right? It was the combination of 22 departments and agencies plus the creation of a, of a few more. It's the third largest department of the federal government um, now. Uh, I, I think most people don't realize the, the depth and breadth of the Department of Homeland Security, and that means that we're operating simultaneously on different problems at the same time. And we're not just operating domestically. We have uh, uh, operations underway uh, and our personnel uh, in something like 73 different countries. So we have a large international footprint as well. Um, the threat keeps changing. The terrorism threat keeps changing. Um, you know, I begin um, every day, as, as Mike did, uh, with a, with a, a, a security briefing that uh, it can, uh, contains uh, intelligence gathered from a variety of sources. Uh, I have representatives there from different departments of the federal government that we interact with all the time, uh, like the FBI, like the CIA. Um, uh, in that briefing, there's a section on the weather uh, because uh, we have uh, the weather is a big security issue. Ask the people of Joplin, Missouri, for example, uh, uh, what what that means for them and their lives and their community and their families. So you have to be able uh, to run this department and deal with a multitude of issues all happening at the same time. And the trick to it, I think, is uh, not to run the department like a rugby scrum uh, where everybody just goes to the latest issue, right? Uh, but you have to be able to... to uh, move in lanes and have people keep their lanes while you uh, have overall a sense of what's happening. The Department of Change uh, has changed, of course, and so have public attitudes about terrorism. Let me ask you both this question. What would be a mature attitude for the American public to have about terrorism, and do we have it? Well, I think... By the way, the murmur indicates people thought that was a really good question. I, I <laughs> Or maybe it's just shock. I don't know. I um, here is uh, there's a, you hear this saying all the time is uh, we have to succeed all the time and the terrorists only have to succeed once to win, and that is such a bad way to uh, think of the terrorist environment uh, that we are in. 
um, we have to uh, maximize our ability uh, to prevent a terrorist act from being successful and maximize our ability to respond quickly and effectively and get right back up and get right back to work. Uh, but there may come a time, despite best efforts, uh, that one of these uh, plots succeeds. And so uh, what, we, what I think we want to do is make sure the American people understand we're all in this together in terms of prevention, uh, but prevention is not always 100%. And by the way, just because one act was committed or was successful doesn't mean they won anything. Right, we're still the same United States. I, I would I would agree with that. I, I guess I, I had two points. Obviously, the scale of the consequence matters, <clears throat> and the reaction. I once got in trouble for pointing out that if ten thousand people die, it's a worse consequence than if ten people die. But the truth is, and it's a hard thing to say that if you're in this business, you have to recognize that as bad as 10 people dying is, 10,000 or 100,000 is worse. So obviously the degree of consequence matters. Um, But I would say, you know, here's a good way to think about it. Look at the airline industry. We have a very safe airline industry. I'm not talking now about security, just safety. Um, But it's not perfect. Unfortunately, from time to time, you do hear about air accidents. But people are sufficiently confident that everything reasonable is done for safety that we don't see the collapse of the air system because we have an occasional uh, accident and obviously fatalities result. So that's a maturity that recognizes that we have to do everything reasonable to to prevent, but we also have to have the resiliency to mitigate the damage and also to bounce back. Well, are we there? Well, I think... uh we're a long way toward being there, and and unfortunately, the proof will be in the pudding. If a, if a successful terrorist attack occurs, how does the country respond? How does the media uh, respond in in that instance? Uh, but I I look at in in terms of uh, this spring, for example. This spring, uh, we had twelve hundred plus uh, tornadoes, five hundred plus casualties as a result of tornadoes. Whole. Uh, cities just wiped off the map almost, uh, and uh, in all of them, they're getting ready to start school in the fall. I mean, kids will go back to school, um, and I think that gives you a sense of resilience in the country. The other thing is part of Homeland Security has been grants, and uh, I want to just pause a moment on that. What the Congress has done is funnel a lot of money into uh, local first responders, for equipment and for training uh, and for some personnel. And we we just plain have more capability across the country in cities and towns across uh, the United States to respond, to save lives, uh, to uh, get uh, things back up and running more quickly uh, than we did prior to the creation of DHS. You know, one important point about the reaction to an event is precisely in the issue of response. I mean, look at two... <clears throat> tragic events. Uh, one was Mumbai 2008 and the other was what just happened in Norway. And um, I want to appear critical, but I think one of the uh, reasons that those were as uh, difficult to sustain and there was such a negative public reaction was the response was very slow. The response in Mumbai, I think the incident went on for about 60 hours. And even in Norway, it went on for a considerable period of time because they couldn't get uh, police on the scene. Uh, it's my sense that on, on, on what I would call a Mumbai-style attack, the difference between the public obviously being grieving but, but basically re- responding without hysteria, the difference between that and a real crisis of confidence is the ability for local law enforcement to respond quickly. And that's why a lot of these uh, enabling grants, which were sometimes criti- criticized, actually do perform the function, um, which we're pretty good at in this country, of jumping on one of these problems quickly and making sure we shut it down as fast as possible. Let's talk about those grants. The total amount of grants to state and local governments since the department was created is $31 billion. Um, And some of that has gone, of course, to the cities where it's believed the threat is most serious, but not all of it has. Um, And I guess there, there was a lot of money pushed out very early on in the department's history, but 
I'm, I'm back to my thermometer analogy for a moment. Uh, are we there yet? I mean, how, how, do we need to give them another $31 billion? And how do you know whether you've given them enough? Well, you want me to go first? I, 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 well, I, I would say that um, at the very beginning, a lot of money was pushed out. I think over the period of time I was in, in the department, we moved more into a focus on where the, the higher risk was when we kind of tiered the cities. And a lot of money went to the cities, which you would expect, and somewhat less to the others. I do think we're coming to the point where we ought to begin to see, and I think, frankly, the budget crunch is going to compel this. We ought to begin to see a tailing off of the grants. Uh, I used to believe this. The purpose of the grant is to build capabilities and training, but not to be sustainment. It's not meant to carry your operating costs, uh, except in a few instances. It's meant to build you up to the point that you can take over yourself. So there does come a point where you're, you're at that stage. And, uh, you know, I can't tell you whether we're there yet because I've been out for a couple of years, but I would expect, and I suspect the budget issue will drive this, that there will be a, um, a beginning to dial back on the grants, given what we've put out so far. Yeah, I think, uh, well, Congress already has uh, taken a, a whack at that and reduced uh, the funding uh, this year. And so I had a choice to make. The choice was, do we just reduce, uh, and I'll use the what's called the UASI grant, which is, uh, the big anti-terrorism urban area uh, uh, grant. Um, and, uh, and, and the choice presented was, do I just cut everybody across the board uh, to, to meet the number, uh, or do we begin making some uh, choices based on analysis of risk, uh, risk and consequence? Um, and I chose uh, to go the second way, and we actually uh, cut by 50%. Uh, the number of cities that were funded uh, under that. Um, and what was interesting to me is we, we thought there'd be a huge uh, hue and outcry about that. Um, but uh, we did a lot of work. Uh, we kind of laid the groundwork a lot uh, with, with cities, with mayors, and so forth. So there was relatively little. As we move forward, it is our intent uh, to make sure that the, those dollars go where they are needed the most. Now, one of the ways, uh, one of the trade-offs there, and one that I'm willing to accept, is to give uh, localities more flexibility with uh, respect to what grant monies they do receive, uh, so that they can uh, do more uh, themselves to to prioritize uh, and to let them spend some of that money for, as opposed to having to buy a new fire truck, which was. Uh, the original requirement was to purchase new equipment, uh, is to uh, be able to, for example, maintain it um, uh, and maintain new equipment. So uh, some of that flexibility, but, yeah, we are going to see cuts in the future in those programs, and, and we are prepared to make them based on analysis of risk. That's interesting because, Mr. Chertoff, originally flexibility was uh, just exactly what everybody thought there shouldn't be in these grants to local communities because they would, you know, buy – Velvet covered fire engines or something that ever there was a lot of criticism yeah, I that there see was. One of those. Yeah, <laughs> they have one here, I think. Um, <laughs> there was a there was a lot of criticism that this money was being spent inappropriately. Now, Secretary DePaulo says there should be more flexibility. Well, you know, I mean, this is part of the kind of the yin and yang of <clears throat> dealing with grants. Um, I think the original concern was that the grant shouldn't be basically a block grant where, it, you know, you can kind of take care of plugging your budget by using Homeland Security money. Um, you know, in the end, I think we came around to the view, you want to have the flexibility, you want to define the mission for which the money is being given, but you want to give some degree of flexibility in terms of how you achieve that mission. <clears throat> and right, sometimes it may be buying something new, sometimes it may be overhauling and rehabilitating something. Now, you know, flexibility can be abused, and, and so what's going to, you're going to have to watch over time is whether the people who get the money start to really push the envelope in terms of whether it's really directed at Homeland Security. And that's part of why every year you've got to look at this and, and evaluate it. For Americans who live on the border states, I suppose Homeland Security means CBP and ICE, but probably for most Americans it means the Transportation Security Administration. So let's talk a little bit about airline security. Um, if the terrorists are now going to surgically implant explosives, does this suggest that we've sort of reached the end of the road in terms of screening equipment and that, that there's only so much that can be done? 
uh, and we need to concentrate on some other way to make airplanes secure. That's why I said uh, on, on these problems, Pete, we, we really look at them through uh, with many layers, uh, all of which are designed to, to maximize our ability to prevent such a plot from being successful. Uh, one of the initial layers, of course, uh, is the ability to get good intelligence uh, and um, a second layer is good analysis of that intelligence. Uh, a third is a good handle on uh, travel, travel history, uh, what we instruct uh, people to look for in terms of uh, scenarios or travel patterns that may give us a suggestion ab about whether uh, someone is part of such a plot. So there are many different layers that would uh, actually be in place before that individual got to that gate. Now, at the gate, you're right that um, high, you know, it's very difficult to detect uh, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, here uh, is where um, we are focused in terms of uh, funding basic research uh, technology that will help us identify things uh, better, uh, more quickly, less invasively uh, than, than what we have now over time. Uh, so that we keep those passenger lines moving. Uh, we keep in mind the economics of this huge industry that we are uh, working with, uh, but we uh, have a better way to detect whether there is, is something that is being carried on uh, or actually in a body. We don't, we don't have that yet, but we have lots of research on those and other types of projects. Mr. Chertoff, every time there's a YouTube video of a, s a screaming six-year-old being patted down or a grandmother being uh, subjected to some indignity, people always say, what's the matter with those people? Why are they focusing on them? What's the matter with you these know, people? I, I mean, I, I, this, I'm, I, my successors had to defend this. I've had to defend it. And, and I, I think I can use experience to explain. Um, you know, people have a conception. A lot of people have a conception of what they think a terrorist looks like. They think they're going to show up at the screening post, uh, you know, un, half sh unshaven with, you know, foreign language T-shirts and, and um, muttering to themselves. And, and you know, it, it just isn't that easy. First of all... Um, one of the things we've learned, particularly looking at the homegrown terrorism phenomenon, is the people you think are uh, radical, violent jihadis do not uh, actually fit the reality of who they are. There was Jihad Jane, Colleen LaRose, blonde-haired, blue-eyed from Pennsylvania. There was Daniel Maldonado, Hispanic. I mean, these are not people... They come from all ethnic backgrounds. Many of them are converts. So that profiling stuff doesn't work. We have unfortunately seen overseas, eight-year-olds have, that have bombs strapped on them and are detonated in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, in 2006, uh, two of the plotters in the airline plot were going to get on the plane with their one-year-old baby and detonate the plane. So it would be nice to believe that one-year-olds and eight-year-olds can have bombs on them, but it would be contrary to our experience. And then I always hear about people who are elderly, and I always ask this question, what was the age of the man that walked into the Holocaust Museum and tried to kill the people in the museum before he was shot by a guard. He was 92 years old. So I'd like to tell you that when you hit 70, you're totally, you know, beyond yeah. reproach. Um, <laughs> I used to, you know, I used to lock up organized crime figures who were in their 70s. So the reality is, you know, obviously you want to manage risk, and you, you know, you do look at behavior, which I know TSA does, and you look at information um, as a way of, of helping you identify the risk. But it's not as simple as some of the YouTube videos make you think. There's something appropriate about having to talk over a jet noise as you answer this question. But um, <laughs> let's talk about layers. Um, Umar Abdul Mutalib got through the layers, uh, managed to get onto a flight to Detroit on Christmas Day, and tried to set off a bomb in his underwear. President Obama ordered a lot of changes. The U.S. thought it had a good watch listing system in place. Obviously. It wasn't perfect. Uh, is it better now? Yes, uh, and, and uh, you know, sometimes from f from these crises, from the these attempts, uh, you, you learn and you identify a gap uh, in the system. And actually, the gap in the system was pretty interesting. It was that information that CBP had on this side of the ocean was not being communicated to TSA 
on the other side of the ocean where, where a flight would begin, a last point of departure for the United States. Um, and, and when you say it now, you, you say, well, gee, you know, that seems pretty basic. It's, um, again, that blinding clarity of hindsight problem. But uh, that has uh, not only been uh, fixed, but uh, the, the, the exchange of information and sending it overseas and, and what we're doing at last points of departure to the United States now is, uh, is far beyond what existed uh, when, when the so-called underwear bomber made his attempt. You know, there's another interesting just uh, observation um, to be made about the reaction to that near miss. Um, uh, I remember during my tenure, and I think it was probably true up until December of 2009, there were a constant barrage of criticism about the fact that the watch, the no-fly list is too long. It actually wasn't very long to begin with, uh, but it was too long. And um, cut it more. And, of course, the day after the event in Detroit, the very same people who said it's too long said, why isn't it longer? And I know it sounds funny, but it, it actually encapsulates one of the challenges of managing risk, not only in Homeland Security, but in any field. Um, and it's the point about hindsight. Uh, it's hard to put measures in place when you're trying to foresee things, and it's very easy to say more measures sh should have been put in place after it's happened. And the, ch the challenge, the really hard challenge of the job is to strike that balance in the middle. Well, the criticism of the no-fly list, though, wasn't it also that if, if there was someone anywhere in the world named Pete Williams, then everybody named Pete Williams got stopped at the airport? Some of that actually, excuse me, some of that actually was, was cured with Secure Flight, which, again, we, we started and, and was, uh, was now completed under Secretary Napolitano. And that took the process of name matching into the department and also allowed you to collect a little more data about date of birth and, um, uh, you know, a couple of other data points so you could separate out the Pete Williams we don't worry about from this Pete Williams. Right. Well, well said. Uh, let's talk about passenger names. One of the challenges I know you worked on very hard is trying to persuade um, governments overseas that we want, the United States wants a passenger list well before the plane takes off so that the names can be vetted. For both of you, this has proven to be very, very difficult. Why is that? Do our allies overseas have a different view of the terror threat? Yeah, what we're talking about is uh, uh, advanced passenger information, passenger name record information. And realize we're, pa we're processing these things millions, you know, a day in terms of, of travelers. And what we want, and what, what we want to have is a new agreement with uh, the post-Lisbon Treaty EU on the exchange of that uh, information from uh, European last points of departure to the United States. Um, and it is a very complex uh, negotiation underway. Uh, uh, you've had it. I'm, I'm in it now. Uh, we do actually have an agreement in place. Uh, so this isn't a situation like the, uh, the SWIFT agreement, which actually had expired, and we, and we were having to uh, negotiate it from an expired agreement. We have, uh, we have that information sharing in place. Uh, the question is, uh, can we, in the post-Lisbon Treaty world, uh, have a new agreement uh, with Europe? And uh, the key issues um, are really with, within the uh, EU, a heightened sense of what data uh, protection and data retention uh, means. And in their fundamental charter of human rights, one of them is the right to privacy and and. Uh, that gets mixed up in, well, uh, are we invading, unduly invading privacy uh, by having the exchange of this kind of information? Uh, I'm hopeful that we will get there uh, from here. Uh, uh, we have uh, been working assiduously on this for a, a number of months, and a number of my colleagues, my direct counterparts in Europe now, think the new draft that has been presented uh, helps uh, improves both on the security side and on the privacy side. And I'll just end this answer with this. This is a false dichotomy. It's a false dichotomy. We can and need to be able to do both. Uh, and uh, w we do in other contexts. We can do it in this context as well. So part of our uh, challenge in working on this with the EU is, is the art of, of persuading 
the member states of the EU, the members of the European Parliament, that this is a false choice that, that is being uh, uh, presented to them. Help us understand this a little bit, because right after 9-11, the United States got the names after the planes took off. And we had all these situations where planes would be diverted to Bangor, Maine, while you finished vetting the list to see whether it was the, you know, somebody was really on the no-fly list or not. Um, what, 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 when are we getting the lists now? How far in advance of the planes taking off are we now getting this information? We have a current agreement that gives us uh, the names uh, sufficiently in advance of the of the plane taking off that we can vet uh, vet them all against uh, databases. Uh, that agreement doesn't expire into 2014. The desire of the post-Lisbon Treaty uh, EU and the Lisbon Treaty and its and its uh, uh, enactment uh, makes you know is, it was is a big deal vis-a-vis uh, dealing with our European counterparts. But anyway, the desire there was to have a new and improved version of the of the agreement. Let me let me explain why this is important. Um, and I know Richard Benvenisti knows from his time on the 9/11 Commission. Um, I, I was head of criminal division after 9-11. We went back and we looked in the course of the investigation at who paid for tickets, what the um, common number was for contacts for the airline. And through that investigation, we were able to establish about 15 of the 19 hijackers were connected to each other. So that if you knew that one was a terrorist, you'd be able to immediately find that there were 14 others who were suspicious. Now, that's taken from ordinary commercial data that you supply to the airlines called passenger name record information. And that's what's at stake here, is getting that kind of information. In many ways, you can, you can say what it boils down to is this. Maybe the cardinal finding of the 9-11 Commission was you've got to connect the, di- the dots and eliminate the stovepipes. And that's been an article of faith in the U.S. security community since then. The Europeans fundamentally have a different attitude. Their attitude is you want to maintain the stovepipes and you can't connect the dots unless you can get a court to approve it. And those fundamental philosophical differences are, I think, part of what's involved in this uh, issue and also with the SWIFT and some of the other challenges we've had uh, in international agreements. Just one more brief question on this. It did seem like attitudes changed because so many different countries were involved in the chain that got uh, Abdul Muttalib on the plane here. Was that not a turning point? Mm, Not as much as you would think. Uh, It was a turning point uh, uh, for us, as I explained, in terms of pushing data overseas. Um, But uh, there is, uh, within the EU, quite a substantial uh, phalanx of individuals for whom uh, any issue about data collection and data retention uh, is anathema. And that is what we're dealing with in terms of negotiating a new agreement. All right, before we uh, invite questions from the folks here, uh, let me ask you about, we've talked a lot about what the government is doing to make America safer, but both of you have pointed out repeatedly that most of the nation's sensitive infrastructure is actually in private hands. So since uh, the, deb- the beginning of the Department of Homeland Security, how well has private industry done in making itself more secure? Mr. Chertoff? <clears throat> no thermometer? <laughs> hey, on the thermometer. No, we're not going to do the thermometer. Idea. Um, you know, I, again, I, I have to judge uh, both from my experience in the public sector and then in the private sector. I think things have improved, but I think there's more work that needs to be done. And frankly, I think there's uh, variation. Uh, I'm not, and I'm not going to identify specifically what industries I think are less well-developed. The one thing I will uh, spend a moment on is cybersecurity. That has become – if, if you said to me, what are the two high-consequence terrorist – uh, or homeland security things I would most worry about. Maybe lower probability than Mumbai-style attack, but really high consequence. I'd say biological and cyber. We've seen multiple cyber attacks. Um, we're beginning to make some progress in putting together uh, a, a, a systematic approach on this. I know that the department's working on some things uh, to move forward on that on the legislative front, and Department of Defense is doing some things. Most of this is in private hands. And a lot of it, no matter how good the strategies are, are going to require the private sector to take the responsibility for maintaining their own cyber hygiene and cyber security. And that's an area where I think we, we need to really step up the urgency. How do you do that? Well, that's going to be – it'll be very interesting because this year uh, there's the potential that Congress will take up 
uh, cybersecurity legislation that kind of uh, confirms the authorities, the jurisdictions, uh, particularly between uh, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense, the two major departments uh, who have responsibility in, in cyberspace. Um, one of the issues, if not the key issue, uh, will be whether uh, businesses, uh, particular businesses in certain identified critical infrastructure areas will be required to provide notice to the government when there's an intrusion uh, or provide other kind of notice or whether there will be some sort of positive incentive for them to do so. Um, and so, you know, we get to that, that classic problem of uh, kind of uh, mandate versus voluntariness. Um, but it is, uh, I think, uh, still, um, uh, we still do not have in too many um, areas of private ownership of critical infrastructure a uh, sense that security and, and, and prevention are core competencies. These are not things that you pay for after you have done everything else, but these are core competencies that have to be incorporated in, in, from the beginning of the business plan uh, moving forward. So uh, in, in my view, uh, we need to work closely, and we do uh, with the private sector. We work out very complicated uh, issues, um, but not enough business really looks upon security as one of their core competencies. Why? Because historically security has been more of a governmental function. Well, it was imposed by the government on the chemical industry, for example. Uh, uh, it's one thing to say Sony's security isn't good enough because people can get the names of folks who go online to play PlayStation. But it's another thing to say that a utility that controls the power grid uh, on the Internet uh, should have more security. So is the answer here to say, like we did with the chemical industry, you, the government requires you to have more cybersecurity if you're going to use the Internet to control sensitive infrastructure? Well, again, I, I, you know, that argument could take up all day. Uh, and, and there are very reasoned arguments on both sides of that. But in the end, um, I, I think that the answer will depend on precisely defining what we mean by critical infrastructure. Who, who really, if subject to attack, um, uh, would have an enormous consequence versus who would uh, uh, maybe not at that at level. And then uh, also, if we're gonna do, we want to proceed by incentive as opposed to uh, regulatory mandate, well, what kind of incentive would really work? You know, I think, Pete, because I'm not in an administration, I have a little more freedom to advocate for a point of view on this. Um, I think that the thing to remember is this. When you talk about critical infrastructure, you're talking about something which, if it fails, will have a huge collateral consequence on a lot of other people who depend on it. <clears throat> now, normally, you know, we rely on the market and we say – Everybody's got a business. They've got to invest what they think is appropriate to defend their business. And if they're wrong, they're going to go out of business. The market doesn't work, though, in a situation where the failure, the cost of failure far exceeds the value of the asset. No one is going to invest money to protect an asset if the money they ha inv have to invest is five times the value of the asset. The problem is if that asset fails and if it's critical – there can be 50 times the consequence. And that's why there's going to need to be, as was done with the chemical industry, when you have identified what is really critical, and I, I agree we have to be careful about that, you're going to need a mechanism to drive the incentive to a reasonable level of protection so that other people who are innocent bystanders don't suffer if there is a failure due to cyber attack. But should it be surprising that this far – into the history of the Department of Homeland Security, we don't yet have the answer on what the really critical infrastructure is? I, I, I would actually say we, we, we do. I mean, you'll get what, what I think we're girding up for is a battle uh, about people at the margin and people arguing about the fact they should be exempted. And, you know, that's not, that's not new to this. You see it in the EPA area. You see it in the food and drug area. Um, and, and that's going to be where a lot of the skirmishing is about. All right, very good. Uh, did you want to say anything else about that? No, I would concur. Within, within uh, the department, we, we have identified what we view as critical infrastructure, and there is consensus about what it is. But uh, as in all things legislative, there may be alternative points of view. All right, let's hear uh, your questions now. Just like on Jeopardy, please uh, phrase them in the form of a question. And uh, we'll start right here with this gentleman in the front row. Uh, 
The nightmare scenario is a nuclear weapon smuggled into uh, the country and uh, uh, set off in some place like Washington or New York. Uh, no matter how I think of it, I can't think that the risk is negligible, uh, given how porous our borders are. Can you please speak to how safe we are from that kind of a scenario? Do you want to start with what you did and then I'll do with what you did? Um, I, I would say that, uh, you know, <clears throat> first of all, I'd say you have to, again, look at layers. Um, obviously, the first layer is to reduce the risk of proliferation. Uh, what we're worried about is not, I don't think that the Russians or the Chinese are going to smuggle a bomb across the border, but that a terrorist group or, um, you know, someone who steals or somehow gets a hold of a weapon will smuggle it. So, I mean, there are, there is, are proliferation initiatives in place. Um, in terms of coming, things that come in the border uh, through the ports, uh, there are, again, intelligence-based methods for determining what things have to be looked at more closely. Um, we've invested a fair amount, a considerable amount, in uh, cargo containers, although my own view is actually that's somewhat lower risk than, than something else, which I'll come to in a moment. So I think in a, we have barriers as you get in. Um, and I think it's also, frankly, it would certainly be difficult to fabricate a bomb for a terrorist group. Uh, stealing one might be slightly easier, but I still think more remote. The one vulnerability which I'm concerned about, and I don't know, I think Janet can maybe comment on where we've moved from there. I was worried about private international air traffic uh, because I thought if I was a terrorist and I had a bomb, I'm not going to put it in a container and let the longshoremen play around with it. I'm going to rent myself a jet. I'm going to put it on the jet. I'm going to fly in, and before I land, I'm going to detonate it. So we began a rulemaking process to try to create overseas screening with respect to jets, uh, private aircraft coming in from Europe and Asia to try to do some screening on the other side of the border. Um, I think that's a vulnerability that still has to be addressed. Yeah, and I, I would only add um, uh, to that uh, that uh, uh, at the ports themselves, there is technology available. It's actually handheld technology. Um, that allows uh, screening and the like. So just like in a, in a regular conventional airport where we've explained all the layers that uh, lead up to your actual physical presentation at the gate, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, things that have happened uh, before you present at the port, and then there are actually different kinds of detectors, including handhelds. Now, one of the decisions we did make, and I did make uh, in the last couple of weeks, and and this, this just happens when you, when you are exploring a a technology or something that you think will uh, actually answer the problem in a whole variety of scenarios, and you get into that uh, uh, exploration, and it turns out uh, that it's not working. Uh, and then your choice is, do you keep continuing it or do you uh, stop it? And uh, uh, we did this with a program called ASP, uh, and uh, we will take, and our plan is to take some of the money that would have been um, put into that and put it into um, improving the handheld and other detection capabilities that we do have. Over here uh, in the, uh, the gentleman with the uh, blue shirt. Uh, I have a question about the recent tornado season. In particular, concerning the Tuscaloosa tornado, it's been recently reported in the Tuscaloosa News and the Birmingham paper that the federal government, I think it was as of July 1st, is now paying a much lower percentage for the cleanup. Uh, a lot of the cleanup is not done, and there's still much more that needs to be done. How is this in accordance with uh, President Obama showing up a few days after the tornado saying the federal government is going to be there to help the community uh, now and for the extended aftermath? And as a follow-up, does the uh, deficit fiasco that's going on right now, how does it affect the local communities that are still having a tremendous problem with the cleanup? And uh, the local communities, it's been reported, just don't have the m money for the initial cleanup. Well, um, uh, I'll speak to that because uh, this is a function of FEMA and the law, the federal law, governing what FEMA can pay for. And the normal rule is that uh, it's a 75-25 split uh, when the president makes a, a disaster declaration. Uh, and the, the local community has 25 percent. The federal government uh, pays 75. Uh, in uh, certain circumstances, 
that 25 can be adjusted. It can be adjusted to a 90-10, and in very unusual circumstances, it can be adjusted to 100. Uh, but the, the theory behind that is, of the Congress, is that uh, communities ought to be helping pay for their own uh, protection, their own resilience, uh, and they ought to be putting some, some skin in the game and not just leave it to the federal government. Uh, now, with respect to Tuscaloosa, uh, with respect to some of the other uh, tornadoes that uh, occurred in the spring, uh, there was a disaster declaration. Uh, there was an adjustment of the ratio for certain of the cleanup activities, uh, but not for all of them. Uh, and there are, uh, there are things that we look at, a variety of criteria to look at, to say, well, what's a fair thing to do? What's the right thing to do in this circumstance? And so uh, uh, without going into more detail on, on Tuscaloosa, that's generally the process uh, that, uh, that we undergo. Um, obviously, uh, it would be uh, the easiest thing in the world to do is to say, well, we will pay for 100 percent of everything. But the law is actually set up uh, quite differently uh, than that. And um, in, in all that, one, one last factor is this, and that is we have put in, in place, in places like Tuscaloosa, in places uh, like Joplin that I mentioned before, uh, recovery operation centers. There's some in uh, North Dakota. I was in Minot uh, recently. Uh, this is kind of a one-stop shop for individuals who are now finally able to get in and see what the condition of their home is, who finally have had their insurance company assess how much money they're going to get uh, for the damage that they incurred, uh, and who, who now know, uh, for example, whether the small business they work for is going to uh, uh, pay for their employment even while they rebuild um, or not. Uh, so it's, they are set up to be kind of one-stop shops. And one of the interesting things, and I don't... Uh, uh, quite know why this is, but for what's called individual assistance, which is the direct money for uh, individuals, uh, one of our challenges is getting people to actually uh, uh, sign up for the individual assistance. So if anybody out there watching is from Tuscaloosa or Birmingham uh, or Joplin uh, or Minot uh, or uh, uh, certain places in Tennessee, uh, that have been declared disasters, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on. Um, you should go to FEMA.gov and sign up. But just as a quick follow-up, <clears throat> only two months after, and they lowered it to 50% now. I, I'd have to follow up with you on that. I, I don't think your information is accurate. I'll follow up with you after this program. Okay, let's go to this side here, um, right in the middle there. Thank you. Um, it, if it seems like the threat is always changing, as some of you said yourself, but it seems that, um, in a way, do you ever feel like by, by constantly staying one step ahead of the threat, you're actually sparking innovation in, in the threat itself? And if so, for example, the surgical implants and um, as response to the increased um, the scanners, for example... I think actually, I mean, you're right. When you, as you stop something, they move to the next level. But that that should not give you a sense of futility. In fact, I, I think the, the thing about the bomb in the body is a good illustration of a point. <clears throat> the building up of security over time has driven terrorists to ever more complicated and difficult scenarios, which are much more difficult to execute. If we were still screening in the way we did in 2000, you know, uh, or even before 2006, it would be relatively easy to build a bomb you could bring on an airplane and blow it up. Uh, now, if they're at the point that what they have to think about is surgically implanting a bomb of sufficient force in an individual to bring down a plane, their, their ability to do that is going to be very, very, very much less than their ability to build the old-style bomb. And that's really risk management. You are driving the enemy into making it harder and harder to carry out the attacks. Is it going to be impossible? No. But are you reducing the risk substantially? Yes. How about here in the middle uh, somewhere? Yes, ma'am. Right in the front here. Hi, it's Jane Harmon. I know you can't see. 
I would just observe first that what a pleasure it is to see two very competent people of different political parties building on each other's records of success. Uh, my, and and, and uh, really, uh, at least from someone who watched you both closely from Congress, it, we, we dealt you a tough hand because the department is so broad, and both of you have managed very well to help it mature. I wanted to ask about two continuing gaps, however. One is the lack of a national interoperable communications network. Uh, that is not primarily in your jurisdiction. The Federal Communications Commission is supposed to be doing something about that and hasn't. But my question related to that is... If we had near simultaneous attacks in various parts of the country, would we have the ability to coordinate the response? Uh, that's the first one. And the second is overclassification of information. Congress finally passed uh, legislation last year uh, to uh, portion mark uh, 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 memos so that the whole thing isn't classified, only parts are so that the declassified parts and the tear lines can be transferred vertically to, to, to first responders who often don't have security clearances and can't get the information that they need to, to know what to look for and, and, uh, and what to do. So uh, could you address both of those gaps, and are, you know, are we in a better position um, now than we were some years back? Yes and yes. Um, uh, with respect to national interoperability, uh, or uh, as your question says, well, how, how do we go about being able to communicate if we have s incidents going on in different parts of the country simultaneously? Uh, I think we have addressed a lot of those technologically, but more importantly, we've addressed them by way of training and exercise and linking in different systems with each other. Uh, so I, I think... Uh, we're in much uh, better shape. And we actually, in some of our exercises this year, that's the presumption that we are dealing with things uh, all happening in different parts of the country at the same time. Uh, and uh, with respect to classification, um, one, one of the major uh, charges of our Office of Intel and Analysis, um, it, it's not to be a duplicate of the CIA. It's to take Intel... Uh, that has been gathered from a variety of sources, um, uh, do analysis from a homeland security perspective, uh, translate things into language that first responders understand, uh, and get it sent out to the rest of the country at different classification levels because one of the things we have done is focused on having more people spread around the country who do have higher classification levels so they can get more classified information. But at the same time, sending out more products in real time uh, that, are, that can be more uh, widely distributed. And we've had um, example after example after example of that uh, in the last uh, year, and we're getting better and better at it. And, and we have, I think, a really good working relationship, particularly with the FBI, on, on how we do that. Other questions? Yes, in the back there. Given the fact that uh, we're facing a situation where virtually every federal government agency is going to be scaled back and to some extent uh, financially, or so it seems, if you had to prioritize right now, would you say going forward that our top priority should be trying to make sure that there are no terrorist attacks whatsoever or operate under the assumption that uh, there might be, despite our best efforts, and focus more on making sure the success is li of limited scope if and when those attacks occur? You know, that's, <clears throat> that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> I would say this. I would say that, remember, we're talking, you've got to look at Homeland Security as a system and a network. It's not just one department. I would say that if I had to make choices, I would um, look at the relatively uh, Mumbai-style scale attack as one that we have pretty good capability to prevent and pretty good capability to respond to. And therefore, I would uh, put <clears throat> somewhat less investment into that. Where I think there's a unique role the federal government plays um, is in the high-consequence event. That's the thing which, if it happened, would be devastating for the country. And one we've talked about is cyber. The other is bio. Um, we've had a biological attack in this country. It was an anthrax attack in 2001. 
uh, and it was only because the perpetrator chose to be relatively conservative in his application of the weaponized anthrax that we didn't lose many more people. Um, the, the raw material exists in nature. Uh, there are countermeasures, but there are investments that need to be put into place to make those available readily and to also have proper warning. So to me, what I would look at is the unique federal area where nobody else can do it and where the consequence is very high. And that's where I would proportionately put more of what is likely to be a dwindling pot of money. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is is something I suggested earlier, which is we need to avoid if there are cuts just doing kind of across-the-board things so you reach a number. Uh, you know, the... And the number is one thing. It's the, it's the substantive policy underlying that number uh, that really matters. And that's uh, why you have to be prepared to make some choices and uh, to, to say, you know what, that's a really nice program, uh, but it's, it's not going to be focused on, on the kinds of things that we as a federal government uh, believe should be prioritized. Uh, I believe we are uh, doing some of that. We have been doing that work over the last uh, year and a half or so as budgets have become tighter and tighter, uh, and we certainly are in the midst of doing it uh, now because even though we don't have a budget for the, uh, the coming fiscal year, fiscal year 2012, uh, we already need to be preparing uh, next year's budget. And so uh, <clears throat> my, my direction, and I think Mike did the same thing, was uh, don't, do it, don't do it the easy way. We, we're going to have to make some hard choices. Uh, one thing I would add, and I think it, again, applies beyond DHS, is when you have less stuff, you have to work smarter. And that's why investment in those capabilities that increase our ability to make good use of information and intelligence uh, is a real leverage point in terms of getting value. We have time for two quick questions and two quick answers. So the first quick question comes from you. Uh, the recent criticism of the event in Norway of the agencies comparable to the uh, uh, defense uh, <coughs> was that the focus had been to the uh, Islamic terrorists, the exogenous terrorists, and they sort of lost focus on the internal right-wing terrorists. Do we have a similar problem in our country, or are you keeping your eye on that ball as well? We don't have a similar problem. Uh, we, we don't have the luxury of picking out what kind of terrorism we're concerned about. Uh, we, we have to acknowledge and, and, and say, look, uh, terrorism can uh, come out of a variety of ideologies and from a variety of different platforms. We have to multitask here. Um, and so... Uh, uh, I. Uh, you know that, and what we have uh, told our our folks is uh, they need to be uh, focused on terrorism and tactics and techniques and behaviors and early warning systems and all the rest, uh, without regard to which particular ideology may be the motivation. And the final question, right here. Uh, hi. Uh, so it sounds like. The department has done a great job of responding to new threats with new techniques, uh, and we're all very glad of that. My question is, what processes are there, if any, to look around and say what maybe has gone far enough to cause a some amount of its own harm? I'll give the most common example. Uh, after we found out that some of the 9-11 terrorists were here on student visas, it became much harder for students from abroad who graduate here with masters or PhDs or bachelors to stay here. Um, so, you know, I realize that may not be completely under your umbrella, but stuff like that is my question. <laughs> well, I, I do think that, you know, it is important to recognize that we, there are costs to all these things. And I think, you know, we've tried, and I think it's been true over the years, to uh, make sure we don't uh, overdo or we dial back when we can calibrate back in terms of uh, being more efficient. The particular issue you raise, unfortunately, is not, it's not security that's at the heart of that problem. It's a kind of, a, of an uh, economic protectionism that has kept the uh, ab availability of green cards for highly educated people at, a, at an artificially low number, which I would argue actually hurts our economy. But that it tends not to really be mainly in the bailiwick of DHS. I think it's Congress, really, that sets that, that bar. All right. Did you have anything you want to say to that? Uh, no. Maybe someday we can talk about immigration reform at this session. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both very much. <laughs>